Hey, you're listening to The James Altucher Show on YouTube, where you're gonna hear directly from peak performers who have defeated all odds and decided the only way to be truly successful in a world out of balance is to choose yourself. I upload a new video every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. So subscribe to my channel and click on the bell notification right now because you don't wanna miss a thing. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show. Once I became comfortable on stage, I started kind of peeling the layers off and, and really showing my true self of who I really am and kind of how I act around the house. Not that I'm walking around the house going, what? But, uh, you know, but even though you say that is funny, but I would have never done that, that what I just did 10 years ago. Why is that not comfortable with myself, not confident in myself? What do you think changed that allowed you to be more yourself? I know my point of view. And once you get the point of view down, I think a lot of it is so much easier because now you have a point of view you're talking through opposed to just kind of trying to find yourself on stage. And that's just time. It was like eight years in, I felt like, oh, wait, now I'm starting to feel like Sebastian Mascalco on stage. And, and then it, that translates to all aspects of life, uh, just being yourself. It's just a little bit more freeing now that I know who I am, I know myself, and I'm very confident in what I'm doing. And it's kind of bled into all aspects of my life. So for someone listening to this and saying to themselves, you know, I might not want to be a stand-up comedian, but I want to be myself like this guy is talking about how can someone learn a little bit more how to be a little more authentic in their daily interactions so excited to have one of my favorite comedians Sebastian I'm gonna, I'm, I hope I don't brutalize your name Sebastian Maniscalco you got it you got it so uh, you also your your book just came out Stay Hungry I got it in advance I read it it's excellent it's okay. a story of your career basically yeah and you've had a fascinating career it's like you know I've interviewed a lot of comedians on here and your career is 100% different from any other comedian that I've had on here well, I don't know anybody else's other story, but for me, it was, uh, what, 1998, I moved out to Los Angeles from Chicago, not knowing anything, not knowing anybody, just knowing I wanted to do stand-up comedy, didn't know really how to get into it, and uh, entered a stand-up comedy class, and boom, right from there, uh, kind of got my feet wet with um, kind of how to behave on stage a little bit. And then uh, worked at the Four Seasons Hotel to supplement my income. And, and while you were at the Four Seasons Hotel, you like in between, I don't even understand how you would do it. Like while you were serving tables, you'd, you'd cut out for uh, a set at the at the comedy store, like, and then get back to the Four Seasons. Yeah, so it would be similar to this. Like I would have a section of five or six tables at the Four Seasons, and then I would like uh, make sure all the water was filled, everybody had their dinner or whatever they were eating, and then I would skip to the comedy store and I would do my set, and then I would come back and just pick up the tables where I left off. Uh, How far was the comedy store from the Four uh, Seasons? It was eight-minute drive. So oh pop in the car, race up there. The whole reason I did that is... I never wanted to miss a set because I didn't know who was going to be in the audience that night. I saw a comedian by the name of Freddie Soto one night go up on stage and Mark Anthony was in the audience who was a singer yeah. and still is. Uh, and he picked Freddie Soto to go and open up for him on the road. So it's like, I thought if I ever missed an opportunity like that, who knows? It could be a director. It could be whoever in the audience. But also, it seems like you had this enormous work ethic even before that. You described uh, several kind of even just odd jobs you had before that, plus your work ethic at the Four Seasons. You were very uh, almost fastidious of every single job. It doesn't sound like you were ever uh, disrespectful of any job, no matter how low or, or high. And I think that yeah. uh, applied over to comedy. So it's not like you were performing badly at all these other jobs because you were this screwball comic and then you were just, you know, fastidious about that. It seems like that was all throughout your career. 
Yeah, so the whole uh, work ethic was instilled in me as a young kid. I mean, I, I had I was cutting lawns when I was a kid to make extra money. I uh, worked at Fuddruckers. I worked at Olin Mills Portrait Studio. I was drop, dressing up as Captain Morgan and going into bars and passing out shots. So nothing I took, uh, any job I ever took, I ever, I really, really respected the work and needed the money and and wasn't shameful or bashful at all about you know making a dime. Um, I just, I, my, my parents were charging me rent right after college. I was paying 300 bucks a month to live in the house I grew up in. <laughs> so there was, uh, those, those lessons early on kind of instilled in me that you have to be able to, uh, provide for yourself. And you're right. It kind of mirrored itself with comedy. I'm like, if I want to do this, I got to get up on stage four or five nights, at, uh, four or five times a night. Four or five times a night. I would try, yeah. I would try to bounce around like whoever uh, was having a show. Like if if you were doing a show, I would get in touch with you. You know, I'd do your seven o'clock, then I'd go bounce and do a eight o'clock over at Dublin's. And there was a sushi house at the time called Miyagi's that had comedy. And Dublin's was was one of those places that also seemed to attract a lot of talent. You know, and that's where you met a lot of people. That's what you met uh, Andrew Dice Clay, where you you that did give you an opportunity. You went on the road with him. Is that, is that where you met Andrew Dice? No, or is that I where met, you met Vince Vaughn? Uh, Vince Vaughn at uh, Dublin's and then Andrew I met at uh, the comedy store. Right, right. So again, you go out, you have to put yourself out there in order to kind of be in the mix. Because again, you don't know who you're going to meet. You don't know who you're going to start talking to. And next thing you know, boom. If I wasn't at the comedy store that one night and Dice Clay uh, was there, I would have never gotten the opportunity to go out on the road with him. Vice versa with the uh, with the Dublins. I met Vince Vaughn in the back of Dublins. If I never put myself out there, you never create these opportunities for yourself. So my whole thing was I never got into this business for money at all. That was not what I got into uh, comedy for. It was my goal was when I moved out, I want to do stand-up comedy for a living, and that's it. I just wanted to pay the bills. And, and so, so let me address that, and I hope I don't embarrass you with it, but like, so just for some some statistics... First, you've done three Showtime comedy specials, right? And um, but really, the main way you're, you're, I would say you're probably one of the most successful road comics ever. Like that's pure road, meaning you, it's not like you have this massive TV platform and then you get paid twenty million by Netflix. You're out there on the road. Yeah, I think I read you do a hundred shows a year on the road. Yeah, that's how I established the the comedy. Uh, as far as I didn't, you're right. I didn't have any TV. I didn't have any film to back up my uh, my road work. Normally, some of these comedians they have a big TV show and they tour off the popularity of the TV show. And, and not that that's bad or good. It's it, huh. but, I, but it's almost like in a, a more pure way. Like you didn't let anybody, like you didn't let any network executive deem you the next prince of comedy. You kind of just I want to explore this. You kind of like. Did it on your own and to the point, and this is maybe the embarrassing part. Forbes list you as making fifteen million dollars last year just from uh, road shows. I mean, I'm trying to think of other comedians. Maybe Bill Burr is like that a little bit. Uh, there's not that many comics I could think like that uh, have that where it's purely they just they built their career on their own, you know, hands and feet. I don't know what the expression is, but they without any. It's not like that. It was without any help, but you again. You know, like I would say, and this doesn't put down their comedies at all, but like Amy Schumer, who's who's great, but she had the TV show Inside Amy Schumer. She had the comedy roast on Comedy Central. You have uh, Louis C.K. with the show Louis, and and his specials were were hitting big before then. You you were kind of like it's almost like every road show you did, you added ten more people, and yeah, then you right. did just thousands of road shows in the past ten years. That's how it happened. So uh, two thousand five, I told my agent, I go get me out there. I don't give a I don't, I don't care what it is, you can where it here, is. By the way. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't want to say anything. Uh, I didn't want to swear, but um, I said, get me out there. I don't care if it's a week in Las Vegas, 14 shows. I don't care if it's uh, seven shows, three on, three on Saturday in Des Moines, Iowa. Just get me out there. Let me not only uh, develop a fan base, but develop my, my comedy because you get really good doing seven hours of comedy 
over a weekend, uh, opposed to like you know New York City, you get fifteen minutes here, fifteen minutes there. I was doing nice hour headlining sets, developing the material, and then what I would do is after the show was over, I don't care how many people were in the audience, it could have been fifteen people. I would sit by the door and I would shake everybody's hand and thank them for coming. Uh, when I do comedy, I feel like people are coming to my house. And I, I'm, I'm the host, mm. and not only that, because you're coming out to see me, right? It's 20, 20 bucks at the comedy clubs, right? It's two drink minimum. You got to get a babysitter. All this stuff that goes into comedy means a lot for me. That somebody took a sliver of their uh, a night out of their year to come spend it with me. So if you're gonna do that, I'm gonna thank you for coming and shake your hand. If they wanted a photo, we'll take a photo. And it was just more of an organic thing that I just kind of grew up with. Like you, you, you thank people for coming out, and uh, you're right. Fifteen people on a Thursday one year. The next time I came back on a Thursday, it was eighty people because they went and told their friends. So that happened year after year after year until we graduated from the clubs and start going into larger venues. And that's kind of what you're seeing now in the last three years. It's just. Uh, a culmination of all those road gigs uh, everywhere in the country just building the fan base. Because it's amazing. It's not like even you have this huge social media following. No, it's like none. It, it's like you, right? <laughs> so, so, and that's not bad. Like it kind of sh- underlines that it still goes back to raw, you know, talent, word of mouth, touching the fans and and them telling their neighbor, hey, um, I went last year, now I'm going this year, you want to come? And uh, and building up that way, yeah. It's almost like uh, it was the '80s when there was no social media. It was like word of mouth and an actual word of mouth, not like, "Hey, this guy's funny." Listen, I've had uh, some success online with a couple videos going viral, but uh, if you look at the people that are coming out to my shows, it's it's middle class people. Uh, it's people who have families. Uh, they have a little bit of disposable income to spend. On tickets, and uh, those people typically, at least, at least from my friends back in Chicago, I got I got about five or six buddies back in Chicago. They ain't they ain't checking their Instagram, they ain't checking their Twitter. They're busy. They're working. They're raising a family. So uh, my social media numbers do not match at all the numbers that are coming out to see my shows. I mean, if you look at my Instagram, it's got like half a million people. And I'm going to Toronto, and I'm playing an eighteen thousand seat arena on Thursday night. It just it, does, it doesn't make sense, right? So how do how do those eighteen thousand people in, in Toronto how do they even hear that you are going to appear? Because so many people are focused on social media, like, and that's where people consume their news now. How do people even hear that you are going to be in Toronto? Well, they hear it through social media, but when I, what what it's like one person hears it, and then they tell the people in their family, and then those people tell other people. It's almost like a telephone, you know, like people are just calling other people. Hey, he's coming, da, 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 da. and that's the way it works for me. It's not so much that the people that are uh, consuming a lot of YouTube videos necessarily are the people that are coming to my shows. It's more. Uh, like I said, people that might see a video here and there, but are not living online. So, so uh, I mean, even so, you're doing Radio City Music Hall in April, five nights, right? Mm-hmm. I think you sold out in 30 minutes after yeah, five the- shows. We didn't know how many to add. I did. I didn't want to do too many, but I wanted to do just enough because we're filming a special there, April 21st. So we put, uh, and I think two on sale at, at first, and then they went fast. We put another two, and then we put another one, and we could have kept going, but. You know, New York City is one of my biggest markets, and I didn't want to. Uh, because, like, be, all of Brooklyn, it probably goes to see you. <laughs> every, everywhere. It's Brooklyn, Staten Island, it's Long Island, it's uh, Manhattan, it's Bronx. It's, it's, uh, and it's just not, a, it's not only Italian people. I don't want to uh, make it sound like my only clientele is Italian. It's, yeah. it's, um, it's people that grew up kind of in that environment. You could be Spanish, you could be Jewish, you could be a Greek, and, and you could kind of relate to an immigrant upbringing. You could be African American and have a father like I had. You know, like it, it's not specific to just one culture. It just so happens that some of the things I talk about are very specific in the Italian community, and the Italians have seemed to really gravitate towards my material just because it's very familiar and uh, they feel like they grew up with me. I mean, every time I talk to these people, they're like, did you grow up in our house? You're talking about my father like you know him. And uh, that, for me, has been a, a big key in my material is that that uh, that nuance of 
of comedy that kind of uh, is very specific in in that type of family. Look, I, I wanna I wanna talk about that nuance in two different ways because I think being uniquely you is part of the reason the word of mouth spreads. Because when I watch your comedy, and you you talk about this a little in the book, where you know you sort of say, okay, it's really started to take off when you found your real voice and talking about like your 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 personal life, your family, everything. And then I watch the comedy, and it's very personal. It's it's almost like these instead of like classic premise punchline, although you'll ha- you'll have those. It's these exaggerated, almost not quite stereotypes, but exaggerated situations that you've been through, where you're very, you're very physical. You know, you're moving around, you're making all the acts, you know, Italian American accents, but it's so exaggerated. It's funny, and people recognize it at the same time. Yeah. So yeah, um, you have both the exaggeration and the relatability, and that and and the personal. So it's like these three things, but not the classic premise punchline. Yeah, there's no like. Like you're right. There's no like uh, set up punch. Just like I'm not sitting there at my house writing these jokes out. I'm basically living the material and then uh, presenting it on stage, where I'm acting it out in a way where uh, very exaggerated acting out. Yeah, I mean it's very big. It's very theatrical. It's very facial. And uh, I always loved physical uh, type humor. John Ritter being one of my inspirations. Not really a stand up at all. But just the way he kind of moves his body and quick, unexpected movements that are very funny, uh, not clown-like, but very like exaggerated and, and just quick and kind of catch you off guard. Uh, I always kind of really enjoyed his physical humor, along with you know uh, the material being observational based, uh, Seinfeld and Carlin, Richard Pryor. All, all three of those guys kind of watched growing up. Brian right. Regan, right? So, so can I ask you like a specific example? So, there's one joke which I'm gonna bastardize because I'm just saying the joke, but it's um, it was in your show. I think it was the most recent Showtime special or the one before that. Um, your wife's father is dead. You're visiting the grave. He bought the plot next to it for his wife, yeah. who is currently Married. remarried. Yeah. So that's the premise yeah. essentially. And so you're there wondering, and it's a very common thing to wonder, uh, like a great observation, which is like, is she going to use this? She's remarried. If she's not going to use it, but it's paid for, should you use it? Like, yeah. So start, it's, it's almost punchy when you start to suggest if you use it. But what's really happening while you're saying this joke is you're, all, you're looking backwards, you're looking forwards, your hands are waving all around. You're, it's very physical. And people are, people are A, noticing that, yeah, that's an interesting question. It's an interesting observation, so they're thinking about it. And then it's funny just the way you're presenting it. Well, yeah, you could just say the joke like you just did and not act it out. But what I want to do is, but then it wouldn't be funny. Like I, I'm just making an observation, and it's not funny if you just if you yeah, don't act it out. It could no, it, it could be funny. You could get like a, a chuckle uh, if you just said it that way, or if I just said it that way. But what I want to do is, I want to take the audience member to the cemetery with me. Right. And walk up to the grave. And I think I take a knee in the bit and I do like the sign of the cross. And I'm like weeping. But at this time, I'm weeping. I'm thinking about what you just said about, you know, who's using this plot, you know, and, and it adds another dimension when you start transporting people from where they're at. Cause a lot of people might think about it. Like they, they listen to a joke, they might think about it and they create it in their own head. But I want them to let me do that for them, and they they could actually see me at the cemetery. So it's like these little mini scenes I want to create on stage, as opposed to having them formulate an idea of what that might look like. Right, because it's an interesting observation because there's all there's it's layered in the sense that it's almost like this post mortem betrayal, like the wife's plot is going somewhere else now. So there's there's a little bit of tension in there that the audience can relate to. And and they're and they're thinking of it maybe in the way that most people would think about it is okay that's an that's something that's unusual but I'm not going to say anything. Meanwhile, you're like a megaphone magnifying the unusual characteristics of this, and that releases the tension perhaps in a way that they can laugh at because it's almost so exaggerated. Yeah, but when I say the bit, when I when I say in that particular bit, I am thinking that nobody in the audience would ever think the, the way I'm thinking about this. They would go to the cemetery, they would say a prayer, and they would go home. Right. I'm thinking that 
I'm the only guy in the room that thinks this way. And that's kind of how I sell it. Because if I think you think this way, I ain't going to sell the joke because mm-hmm. I don't have to convince you. You already know. The way my mind works is I, I kind of preface it by saying that I'm thinking about things that really nobody else is really thinking about it. But when I mention it to you, you go, yeah, where is she going to get buried? <laughs> right. So uh, that's the way I kind of sell these jokes because if I sell it like I think you know it already, it doesn't come off and it doesn't hit as hard as it would if if I I think... Uh, everybody else uh, knows about it, but but take just that, like what you just did. You made a voice when you, when you said that, as opposed to just making an observation. It was observation plus mm-hmm. funny voice. So there is this process it seems you go through, which is okay. Th- you're probably constantly noticing observations in family life and your past history and so on, and then layering on top of that, kind of the. Uh, you know the act out, and and maybe some exaggerated motions, and then you have you have like the funny voice, and all of that together does. Everybody in the audience is laughing at that yeah, point. Yeah. So it's not, again, it's not like the classic, um, I'll, I'll, you know, Rodney Dangerfield like boom pump, you know, punchline. Yeah, yeah. So it's 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 interesting the the process. I don't know if you think of it that way or I don't really think of it. I, it's not like I set out to do this. I, I'd say one day, man. I'm going to get really physical on stage. I'm going to really put a lot of facial expression in my face or I'm going to uh, fluctuate my voice here and there. It's almost kind of a thing that happened organically. Once I became comfortable on stage, I started kind of peeling the layers off and and really showing my true self of who I really am and kind of how I act around the house. Not that I'm walking around the house going, what? (laughs) <laughs> but uh, you know, but even though you say that is funny, but I would have never done that. that what I just did in an interview ten years ago, huh. you know, why is that? Be, uh, not comfortable with myself, not confident in myself that that might be funny, or uh, even even interviewing, even going on these TV shows that I've been on today. I noticed that what I was doing on these TV shows, I would have never been able to do ten years ago because I would have not allowed. I would have been editing myself. What What do you think changed? At some point, so you've been doing comedy, let's say for for twenty years almost, or maybe more, maybe less. Twenty. Twenty. So, uh, what do you think changed around year ten that allowed you to be more yourself, both in terms of talking about your personal life and in terms of like this almost persona that you that you're comfortable with now? Yeah, it, it was just that comfortability on stage, that knowing whatever I kind of. Uh, play through this instrument is going to be funny because I've honed the instrument so so much over time that I know that uh, whatever whatever I might be talking about, it could go spin class with my wife, it could be going on an airplane, it could be me going to a tech business, which I recently did, to see how people behave now in the new uh, work environment. I used to work at United Airlines when uh, 1996, and there was cubes. You sat in a cube, and you went home. Now you go to a business and you know, people are running on a treadmill typing an email. There's ping pong in the commissary. You know, it looks like camp. So anything that I put, kind of put through this filter, I know my point of view. And once you get the point of view down, I think a lot, a lot of it is so much easier because now you have a, 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 a point of view you're talking through opposed to just kind of trying to find yourself on stage and just... You know, when I first started, I was completely angry. I was not likable. I didn't laugh at myself on stage. Nobody was in on the joke. You know, it, 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 the way I think is a little absurd, but I made it sound like I was talking at the audience rather than like, "Hey, everybody else outside this room is crazy. We're the normal ones." You know, like I, I was talking at the audience like they were the problem. So again, that's just time. It takes time to kind of feel comfortable on stage. And after uh, 2005, it was like eight. Eight years in, I felt like, oh, wait, now I'm starting to feel like Sebastian Maniscalco on stage uh, rather than a, uh, a a copy of, of him in, in some distorted way. So, uh, and, and then it, that translates to all aspects of life, uh, just being yourself. Like, I, I was a little bit more introverted when I first started doing comedy. Even when I would check into a hotel, I didn't really talk to the anybody. I would just head down it, you know, get the key, you know. Now I come in, hey, how you doing? How's it going? It's just a little bit more freeing now that I know who I am, I know myself, and I'm very confident in what I'm doing. And it's kind of bled into all aspects of my life. 
Let's stop to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Every podcast I do is so personal and special to me. The podcast is all about how people can be better performers, even peak performers at whatever it is they are passionate about. So help people discover this podcast. Help me, help the listeners. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or wherever it is you get your podcasts. You can also check out the show notes at jamesaltitude.com slash podcast. And also, if you want to get my blog updates and other updates that I do, sign up for the newsletter at jamesaltitude.com. Once again, thanks so much for joining me on the journey of this podcast. Like for someone listening to this and saying to themselves, you know, I might not want to be a stand-up comedian, but I want to be myself. Like this guy is talking about how can someone learn a little bit more, how to be a little more authentic in their daily interactions? Like, is there a way to kind of skip part of those 10 years, if, even if you're not going on stage seven times a night? Uh, whatever it is, it, it doesn't have to be stage. It could be whatever you're doing. Uh, and I think over time, you'll begin to, you know, peel those layers off, whether you want, you want to be an entrepreneur, you want to be a musician, you want to be a teacher, whatever it is. I'm sure when you come out of college and you're teaching a class, uh, you're not the same person as you are when you're 40 years old teaching that same class because you have all that experience to draw from. So I don't think there's shortcuts. I don't think you skip 10 years. It's you got to you got to go through the 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 time and the pain and 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 to really find out who you are and it, it doesn't have to be like I said I'm just speaking because I went on stage to do it, but if you're a businessman, it's like you got to be in there at uh, 6 o'clock in the morning pounding the pavement trying to uh to make money and uh and again, it might not happen a year, two, three, four years, but is, if you feel passionate about it, the whole thing is passion. You got to feel passion what you're doing. If you didn't feel passion and doing these, uh, these three, t- three times a week, you're doing this, right? You, you, I, I would tell if you're not passionate about it. I could tell right away that you really care about this thing. It took time to read the book. There's a lot of people that don't even read the book or they read a couple pages or they'll get like a synopsis or whatever. The, the fact that you know you took some time and, and did some research tells me that the guy's passionate about what he's doing. So you can't really substitute that passion in anything that you're doing. So what I would advise these people out there that are listening to your show, if they have a passion and then they want to be themselves and, and whatever, you got, you got to go out there and, and, and work. I mean, like, there's no... I wish I had like a magic formula to tell you, yeah, by 26 you could be doing... Uh, you could be headlining theaters across the country. It's just... It might happen, but uh, I don't. So, 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 let me ask it in a slightly different way. Not, in, not is there a way to skip it? But let's say you did build up authenticity. I don't know in your cubicle at, you know, United Airlines or whatever. Could you then translate that authenticity into another area? Let's say you want to reinvent yourself, and now you want to be in another area of life. A lot, a lot of people reinvent them, want to reinvent themselves at age forty or fifty or whatever. Could you? Could someone say, "Oh, I've." I'm, I've I've really gone as far as I can in this area. I'm I'm really myself, but now I want to do something else. Yeah, if you redirect that same passion to whatever you want to do, whatever career do you, that is. Do you think that would be faster in terms of like, let's say, you know, going on stage or or doing something more creative or being a writer or whatever? Um, I don't. I'm not sure. I understand the question. In, what in what terms do you mean of, by faster? In terms of you, you, you spent ten years. Going up on stage, learning this persona and, and learning this authenticity for to be a stand-up comedian. Um, let's say now you wanted to go into some area, like you wanted to be an actor, or you wanted to be well, you are a writer. Do you think that those the skill set yeah. translates? Yes. So I could never have been a writer without the experience I had as a stand-up comedian. Because uh, some writers might say, "Oh, you needed to write five books before you could write this book." Yeah, I but, mean, you know, authors that do this for a living say, "What do you know about writing? You do stand-up comedy. You don't write books. I write books." But I have twenty years of experience doing something that now is translated. That passion is translated. This is not such a far departure from stand-up comedy. These are funny stories that now written 
written down on a, on paper rather than me telling. These are stories that I tell, but now I just happen to write them down in a book. So it's not like I went from being a stand up comedian, but now I want to do heart surgery. That's a whole other thing. Now you right. got to start at level one and then go up. But you know these these little branches that come off these acting, the book or podcasting or whatever. It's not that far of a departure from what I'm doing to begin with. So yeah, I mean. If you stay close to where you're at, uh, I think a lot of other things are like this are possible. But if you want to do something completely different, again, you got to, you know, like like Michael Jordan, when he went from basketball to baseball, he had to start in the mind. He didn't cross over and go right to the White Sox. He had to right. start at the, at the bottom and work his way way up. Helps to be an athlete. That's, that's what he had going for him. But the skill set wasn't as, as great as to get him into the uh, major leagues. Well, what, what I love so much about talking to stand-up comedians and successful stand-up comedians is that most people don't realize how it's, it's like the hardest skill ever. Like you could be, I mean, because there's not just one skill. It's not just about being funny. It's about understanding the crowd. It's about likability. It's about uh, doing these, you know, different types of act outs in, in a joke uh, there's so many of these sub skills. Like, what what were skills that you were developing? Even like, I don't know, in the past five years, that surprised you as new skills that you had to learn. Um, new skills that I had to learn. Um, well, recently, I had to learn to play to larger audience on a consistent basis. Uh, when you go to a three thousand seat theater, it's a lot different. I mean, the intimacy is kind of not there. I mean, when you're in a comedy club, you're literally feeling the person dying laughing in, in, in front of you and you could feel that you feed off of it. And in the theater, it's a little bit different because a little further away, uh, the ceilings are higher, the laughter might get lost. Sometimes you think you're not doing as good as you are because you're not really hearing the laughter as you would in a small comedy club. So there's an adjustment period that happens when you start jumping from these smaller venues to these larger venues. So I kind of had to learn to play the jokes a little bit uh, First of all, even even bigger because now you're in a bigger space. You know, I mean, I, I I'm not I'm not uh, we're sitting down, right? I'm not I'm talking to you. I'm not going to act out my material as, or if I'm going to do an act out talking to somebody, it's not going to be big here mm -hmm. because it doesn't need to be. But yeah, you have to you have to learn that even when you do a big movement in a smaller room, it doesn't even look right. Because it's like if I, if you're on a little small stage like this, and I'm like I'm moving around up there like like an animal. It, it just it doesn't translate. Like why is this guy so? Why is he so big for the room? You know, you kind of have to adjust your material and your uh, facial expressions and your act outs to the size of the room. So that's one thing I had to, to kind of learn. Uh, other than that, um, you know, you have to learn the business of this too. Uh, there's a side of it where you just think a lot of comedians think, oh, you know, if I'm funny, I thought this when I was in, when I was in what four or five years. I'm like, I got like 45, 50 minutes of material. Why am I not headlining clubs? Well, because I can't draw no people there. You know, the, the comedy club owner is not going to tell you to come and you got nobody in the seats. They got to pay the rent. They got to pay the electricity bill. And, and you got to understand that as a comedian that like, this is not like fun and everybody goes up and does their comedy sets. And it's just, it's just not like that. So you have to, you have to, and take this seriously too. You got to promote, you got to come down, you got to do the podcast, you got to go on the, the TV and, and, and get people to come there. Like when, when I used to do radio at six o'clock in the morning, the guy used to pick me up and he, oh, I, get, I bet you hate this. No, I, I don't hate it. I'm, I'm promoting my show. Why would I hate telling people that I'm coming to their city and have them come out? What's the hate about that? Why? Because I'm up at six o'clock in the morning? Big deal. You know, it's again, this is like the work ethic, the staying hungry. That's why I got the book. Uh, that's why I entitled the book Stay Hungry. It's like you got to have that appetite to want this bad. And once you get to the, the, the level that I am, you still have to stay hungry to stay there. You know, if I, if I, if I figure now, hey, I'm, I'm doing 18,000 people on a Thursday night, I got this. No, what my thing is, eight, those 18,000 people that are coming to Toronto on Thursday night, I want to give them such a good show that they leave out of there and they tell another 18,000 people, you got to see this guy when he comes back. Because my biggest fear, and I, a lot of people are like positive, you hear a lot, I'm sure you interview a lot of people that they're like so positive, they're always thinking, hey, this is fine. I've, I live in the fear of no one coming to a show ever again. So that fear is what drives me. It's not the fear of 
uh it's not like it's not like uh I, I see the rock a lot on instagram and he, the guy is like smiling he's like what's going on everybody's excited this and that. that guy's like a positive guy it's not that i'm not positive it's just like i am so fearful of losing what i have gained that's what drives me to to keep going to keep writing new material to hoping these people come back to these shows it's not so much a positive it's more like a living in a, in a negative space well i think actually there's a lot of research that shows that's actually better for success. Now, The Rock, of course, is an exception for a lot of reasons, but uh, uh, let's say your your uh, positive goal is to lose a lot of weight and look great and then you'll be happy. Well, the problem with that is you might achieve those goals and then not be happy. And so you then you kind of are soured forever on the notion of positive thinking. Whereas if you think to yourself, oh, I better not eat this food because I'll get sick and die younger and be miserable and That's whatever. That's where I'm living. Yeah, that, that actually drives you more to not eat the food as opposed to the positive visualization. It's funny you bring that up because I recently I've gone through that. Like I recently had a baby 10 months ago and I, I gained a lot of weight last year, 18 pounds to be exact. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself, I don't want to keep doing this because I, don't, I want my daughter to have a father for a good portion of her life. Not that I was going to die, but that fear of death or that feel of not being healthy or maybe having a heart attack stopped me from, you know, eating at one o'clock in the morning and going out and whatnot and leaning a cleaner lifestyle. And, you know, I'm going to work out tonight, actually. I would never work out at night uh, last uh, last year, but now I'm dedicated to, you know, they got a, I didn't have a purpose before, but now I got even more of a responsibility to to be healthier when you're single and, and you don't have a family and you don't, you know, you're kind of living and floating through life, you, you don't have anybody that you have to be accountable for. But when you have a wife and you have a child, then life becomes a little bit more, uh, I don't want to say serious, but it's like you, you, you know, you have a little, I have a little meatball at home depending on me. So I, I have to be, I have to be right for her. Um, you know, when you started, let's say 10 years ago, you started getting more personal and this is, this relates to, Having a daughter, um, how are you? How is your family comfortable with you kind of telling all these stories on stage? I imagine most of them are true or related to the truth. Uh, was that ever an issue? Yeah, I mean, yeah, but, but your your wife uh, Lana sounds like she's very supportive of your career. She's involved in it, um, so maybe there was this somewhere in the middle. Yeah, the personal stuff tends to listen. I haven't had any problem with my family at all. Except for one joke that I can't tell, but uh, how come you can't tell it? Because it's my mother told me don't don't talk about it. <laughs> that was that was the one thing she said. Just like just leave that alone. Um, my my wife's family has been very very lenient on letting that me talk about them. There's a lot more that I want to do, but it's one of those things where I want to be invited back to Thanksgiving dinner over there. You know, it's like, you got to write, you know, the difference between my wife's family and my, and my family, my family, you could rip to shreds, right? And everybody's got thick skin. On my wife's side of the family, they're a little uh, sensitive. So they not, might not be able to laugh at themselves uh, as, as we do on my side. So, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I make fun of the families, but uh, you got to draw the line somewhere. Um, and I think I know where the line is. And so, so um, when you were starting and you were starting to realize like, oh, okay, I'm not, I keep doing all these angry jokes, but I'm not angry. Uh, and, and you probably weren't very likable uh, to the audience because you were so angry. Even they were, they, they were like, who's this angry guy? Uh, what were, I mean, what were some of the, kind of techniques or or whatever you use to become more likable on stage to have more do more crowd work or have more control over the audience like what were the what were the sort of initial skills you started working on other than just the basic humor well i was told that i was angry from a comedian i talk about it in the book that a com comedian came up to me after i did a set and said you're way too angry not likable up there and she was a veteran comedian so i took it to heart so i went home i started evaluating the tapes i used to tape my sets I audio record them now, but I used to tape my sets and watch them back, and I go, "Wow, this I am angry." I, there's there's some adjustments that need to be made, but again, it's not like I went up the next day and completely got rid of all the anger. It, it takes a while to then, you know, just 
going on stage and, and getting heckled and having four people in a night on a Saturday at one thirty in the morning. Uh, I went to Saudi Arabia. I played in front of 300 women who had veils on. You know, all, Did they laugh? Uh, I heard them. I didn't <laughs> see it. Uh, but all these experiences play into your ability to be so comfortable on stage that nothing can be able to phase you and you could be your entire self up there without worrying about how you're going to handle anything. I, when I first started, I got heckled. I didn't even acknowledge the guy was heckling. I mean, this guy was heckling me bad. I didn't even acknowledge. I, it just kept plowing through my set. Because I, I felt if I acknowledged him, I was going to forget where I was going to go. I couldn't pick it back up. But again, that just takes time to deal with those people, to deal with a heckler. Not sh- Here, even heckling is one of those things. Hey, guys, I could hear you. I'm doing something here. I'm kidding. <laughs> um, uh, it's one of those things where even heckling, if you come hard at a heckler, the audience will go, whoa, this guy, you can't, even, can we laugh? Like you have to be kind of, even though you're angry that the guy's heckling you or maybe he's being disruptive, here like that, right? I, I could hear them, right? Now I could address that a couple of ways. I turned around and I said, hey, do you mind? And then and then I made him laugh. So I got my point across, right? But I made him laugh at the end. So everybody, they shut up. But I don't come off as like an asshole. And you have, you actually, I like the techniques. You have some, some you, have, you have a breakout section with how to deal with different types of hecklers because there are many different varieties mm-hmm. of the breed. Like the drunk heckler, you say, um, you know, something like, aren't you ashamed of yourself? Right no, now, aren't, or, you, yeah, aren't you embarrassed? That yeah. was like one of my titles to my act. And if you come to my show and somebody's misbehaving, and I say, "Aren't you embarrassed?" The whole crowd, you know, turns on that person, and because they know the the saying is mine, and and that's one. And it's way. really relatively safe. It's not attacking. No, the like if it's a drunk woman, for instance, which you really can't, you know, the audience will turn on you for uh, attacking a woman in any way. It's a, it's almost a safe way to sort of put them to the side and separate them from the audience. Drunk woman, no, uh, I, I disagree. A, a drunk yeah. woman is always a problem, and the audience will get behind you 110% really? if you <laughs> get rid of that person. No one, men and women, no one want to hear drunk and, and loud in an audience. Mm-hmm. So we get, the, we get rid of these people quick. It's like you can't even you can't even ha- uh, banter with one of these people. You can banter with a guy and says something, a girl says something, you say it back. But a lot of times people can't even hear it in the audience. Right. So what are you gonna do? You're gonna go back and forth with somebody that, that no one could even hear. It's not even worth it. So uh, and my crowds are really polite and nice. I don't really deal with a lot of hecklers anymore. But in the beginning, I did. Do you, do you do? Any, I mean, right now you do a show, or let's say when you were building up, not in the past three years, but before that, when you were going from like forty people. In Akron, Ohio, to eighty people in Akron, Ohio, to one hundred sixty. Mm-hmm. Were you doing anything like collecting email addresses, or I used to hand out uh, cards at the end of the show, right? The, my postcards. I have all my social media on there. Have my email. I also had a thing where you could write down your email if you wanted to be on my mailing list. So, yeah, when I would go to my car at the end of the night, did I see eighty percent of the flyers littered throughout the the parking garage, yes, but those twenty people or the twenty percent that took it home to me, it's like those twenty percent. At least those people are going to take it home and maybe follow me. Who knows? So it's all this like little guerrilla style marketing techniques. I used to sell my DVDs after the show. The whole thing behind that was, yeah, did I want to make a little extra money? Yeah, you're not going to get rich off it, but I wanted them to take the DVD home, share it with the buddy, that buddy take it to his parents, and then have the DVD. This is when DVDs were were you know popular they're not so much popular now but they spread the word through the dvd it's a little piece of marketing material that i thought that if i sold this after the show that people would share it and so you started 20 years ago you finally quit your job at the four seasons in 2005 seven years later yeah to go on the road and uh at any point and then and then as you mentioned it's been the past three years you've really noticed the big change it's almost like a tipping point so uh, at any point, what, what, what was the most frustrating moment during this period? Because you didn't, you mentioned in the book, you did not give yourself a deadline. You, because uh, because deadlines almost setting yourself up for failure. Because if, if you say five years, but it, the natural course is twenty years, you're gonna yep. fail. Yep. And so, but some people have to quit at some point. But so it's always must have been. It's not like 
you knew, oh, 20 years from now, I'm going to hit the Forbes list of most paid comedians. You never really knew. So what, what was the most frustrating point during this period? The, when I was working uh, selling satellite dishes out of a kiosk in the, in the mall. That's where it was. Uh, That's very in the beginning. Yeah. Well, that was in, two, yeah, that was in 2002, 2003. So it was four or five years in. That was a, kind of a low point for me. But past that, I never really looked back. It was never, I never went to bed going, I'm going to quit. I, this, this is awful. It was always, the comedy is what kept me alive. If, if I wasn't getting on stage, I would be so much worse off than I was. I mean, I had that outlet to go up on stage and express my feelings night after night after night. I didn't bottle them in. I got them out. And it was a way of uh, almost like therapy. So the passion somehow also gave you translated to perseverance. Yeah. And so even on like down, I mean, there, again, there must have been like down moments. Let's say in 2010, you, you, was there any point where you say, I've been doing this 12 years. Um, uh, I, I don't know if you were married then or I'm getting married. Uh, uh, I need to do something. Something needs to click. Did yeah, you, you always say that. But again, you could will this uh, shit to happen. It, it Sometimes it just doesn't, it doesn't happen when you want it to and that's why you have to keep staying hungry and wanting it more yeah you can meet a woman who goes you know what this comedy ain't working get, get a real job you could have that experience and maybe lose your your sight on the on the goal because there's all these external factors playing a huge role but thank god i met a woman who is so supportive of, of what i was doing and 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 100 behind me even my parents you know a lot of people get into this entertainment business they got no support system mm. they're like oh what are you doing with this you're never going to be nothing doing a comedian my parents could have told me that what are you doing are you a comedian come on but they 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 backed me and they were uh emotionally supportive financially supportive and uh and and here I am, you know, at the at the Four Seasons Hotel doing this. Even this even this uh, show that you do, I guarantee you, your audience doesn't know who I am, which is excites me. Well, and it's fascinating, and 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 we'll we'll close with that because uh, your story really is an incredible story in comedy, in that you you personally built up your audience. You kind of like I don't want to say you forced it to happen because obviously there's so much work and so much talent and, and skill that was developed, but you did it. There wasn't like you were leaning on um, network executives to, to say, Sebastian, we're going to now put you in five movies and then you're going to sell at every stadium. Like you kind of did it person by person, which is, a, which is not only unique, but also in, in inspiring in that that is, you know, a, that is probably the traditional way to build a career is you doing it rather than being blessed from above. So congratulations on that. This book is excellent. I highly recommend it. Stay Hungry by Sebastian Maniscalco. And uh, your specials on Showtime, your three specials on so Showtime are fantastic. Uh, I'm yeah. going to check out your your Radio City Music Hall next month. Uh, yeah, April, April I'll be at Radio City. And, and to your listeners, uh, I also have a podcast called The Pete and Sebastian Show that we do once a month. On Sirius XM, right? Uh, yeah, and then it's also a podcast on Apple. So they could check out that if... Uh, I know your your listeners are big podcast people, and even even your listeners. If I could come on here today and get a, a few fans from from your your fan pool, to me that is 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 well worth it. Because again, you never know. Some some people might be listening to this. Who's this guy? I, I, you know, I, I don't like him or what what have you. But there's always those people out there that don't know. We, me and my manager were talking about it today. I'm a, I'm I'm flying underneath. There's a lot of people who don't know who the hell I am which is great. And it means there's more out there. Yeah. I think it's just going to get bigger and bigger because you're already doing so well. It's just going to keep happening. Yeah, no, it's good. I'm, I'm blessed and I, and I appreciate you having me uh, on the show to talk about the, the book and my career. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sebastian. Thanks. You got it. You know, I just want to say thank you to everyone listening to this please take a moment to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or wherever it is you get your podcasts. It will only take a second, but it will help other people discover the podcast and it will really show people in general that this is a quality show and then it's worth listening to. You can also check out the show notes at jamesaltitude.com slash podcast. Also, 
If you want to get my blog updates and other updates that I do, sign up for the newsletter at jamesaltitude.com. Thanks again. I really appreciate you guys. Hey, thank you for listening to the James Altucher Show on YouTube today. I have a really special brand new episode coming out next week, but you can watch it early. Just click on the link right here or subscribe to the channel when you click on my face. And one more thing, don't forget to click the bell. I'll see you next time.